Amen. Thanks, Chuck. Children are dismissed. We're in Psalm 138 today. As you turn there, I want to say a couple things. Wednesday night, we're having a prayer service here. And uh, I, I don't require any of the regular people to come. For instance, I, I don't require Jason to be here. Really, what I want to have happen is I want whoever wants to make Wednesday night a part of your tradition uh, to come, even if it's only a part of your tradition this year, which I guess that makes it not tradition. But if you want to join us, I want you to come because you want to be here. Does that make sense? And I know some of you have family and you didn't have different things you do that that's really really important so we got a day and a half uh, we got Wednesday evening and Thursday uh, to celebrate uh, give thanks with our family so if that's what you're doing do it uh, but if you want to make this a part of your Thanksgiving time your Thanksgiving weekend we're going to be here from 6 30 to 7 30 one hour uh, we're going to have some times of prayer I'm leading three songs so I don't know what possessed Jason to say I could do that but he did so I'm the song leader. I'm going to wave my hands. I'm just, man, I'm going to go crazy. Love it. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a few people praying, and I'm going to have a, a, a devotional. I'll say that more, more than, it's not a sermon as much as it is a devotional. But when we get together, we want to gather around God's word and prayer. And so we're going to do that on Wednesday night. I invite you to join me. Uh, yesterday, we had a blast. Lisa and I went from one event to the other. Uh, <clears throat> over at Barry's house, buying his pottery. Uh, and we went to Eve's garden, and we went to the um, Boy Scouts uh, thing yesterday. And I really didn't know what to expect because um, Jack had said to me during the week, won't you come out and help us sort out the food? And I pictured a few Boy Scouts dropping off bags of food in the lobby. I didn't know why Jack needed so much help, but we came and uh, Went in the gym and it was complete chaos. I've never seen such a thing. All the food coming in. We had 5,000 pounds of food. Can you imagine that? Yeah, praise the Lord. So uh, Doug and Kathy, Hanks and Jack and Sue uh, Miller were kind of doing all the, the work there yesterday. And now I know why Jack's been putting on a little weight. I need to talk to him, but uh, a lot of food. A great way for us to celebrate and worship God uh, together with our community. One of our values is that we do value our community, being a part of that. We're working through some of these things as an elder board so that we can develop our uh, long-range goals and our short-range goals. And to know who we are is really important. But who we are is that we really do value the community around us. And praise the Lord that we are able to come together with so many people, collect all of that food, and as I was here yesterday, someone who doesn't come to our church, I don't know if they're believers or not, <clears throat> came and said, what a great thing it is that you guys are doing. And I think that's the way it ought to be as we serve God. People see that and they're not seeing our service as much as they're seeing God. Uh, because we're not the only people that collect food, but we're one of the ones that are collecting food because we want God to be magnified. And so that was happening yesterday. It was a great time. Then they fed us a bunch of pizza, and then we went home. So it was a, a very good day. Uh, thank you all for your help, the ones who helped out. Psalm 138. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I think of Thanksgiving, uh, the things that come to my mind um, are family and food. I wasn't able to be there, but my, my um, Uncle Kali passed away uh, last week, and I remember going to his house at... Uh, Christmas and we went to my aunt's at Thanksgiving and just all the family and food and things that go on and I thought about some of the things that I liked um, and it brought it up in my mind some of the foods that are the rare foods that people like at Thanksgiving and my favorite one is rutabaga anybody here like rutabaga we had one besides me two three four four of you well, you come to our house because there will be a lot left over. <laughs> uh, but I like it with a little butter, some salt, and some sugar. Very, very good. Uh, my mother-in-law and I, we like the oyster uh, filling or stuffing. What do you call it around here? Is it stuffing or filling? Yeah. Stuffing. All right. That's, all right. We're kindred spirits because I call it stuffing too. 
My wife calls it filling, but the oyster filling. Uh, any any weird things you guys like to eat at uh, Thanksgiving? Think of any strange foods off the top of your head? Nothing? <clears throat> well, the food has a lot to do with it. I remember that orange squash my aunt used to give us. And she's like, plop, plop it on our plate. And my mother was from old school. You know, if it got on my plate somehow, I had to eat it. So it did get on my plate, and I had to eat it. But uh, orange squash, they made it like mashed potatoes. It wasn't like the fried up slices like my wife makes. Uh, so that was, that was kind of rough. But Thanksgiving, we remember it for a lot of things, a lot of reasons. We ought to be people who give thanks. And whether it's patriotic or not, there's something that goes well beyond that, and that is our attitude of thankfulness to God. Now, when you see a person who's, you know, always, you know, bemoaning the fact that they were short-sheeted all through life, well, they didn't do this, and that's that, that person's fault, or my parents didn't do that, or they always treated my brother better, or, or my sister's got more money, and, you know, on and on and on, bemoaning all the, the ways that you've been slighted over the years, and you bring it up over and over and over. As I was reading about Thanksgiving, I was reading that this one article is like, there's one group of people that don't give thanks at Thanksgiving. And I, I suppose it's legit, but it's the group of people that uh, supposedly were killed off by the Puritans and the Pilgrims and all of that, and uh, whose land was taken. It was the Indians, an Indian tribe. And so there's some Indians, every Thanksgiving day, they're, they're just all bitter and angry. It's, it's like, you know, I, I realize you were wronged. But that was over 300 years ago. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like as a, a pastor, a counselor, people come in and talk about stuff, and it's like, dude, that's a long time ago. You should have gotten over that. You should have moved ahead. And what's indicative of the fact that people have gone ahead is that they've become a, gra a gracious people, people filled with gratitude and thankfulness. Instead of saying, well, I was slighted all my life, or I didn't have the opportunities, but to say, I really thank God for the opportunity that I do have. And I thank God for the family I was born in. And I, I thank God for life and breath. I thank God for the, the family, church family he's given us, and the, the family that I'm born in. <clears throat> I quoted this saying last week. It's a, a, a saying by Dr. Jones. It goes this way. When gratitude dies... On the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh, nigh hopeless. When gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless. The uh, percentage of our gratitude or our thankfulness may be indicative of um, our walk with God, our relationship with others. But there are times when a bitter taste in our mouth keeps us from moving ahead. You know, that, that bitterness in our heart, a little bit of bitterness. And so I've kind of equated for this sermon, maybe not for all practical reasons, but the opposite of giving thanks would be bitterness. It could be being rude. It could be you're forgetful. I, I don't know. There, there could be other reasons. But for my purpose in this sermon, it has to do with either you're thankful or you're bitter because we got so much to be thank, to thank God for. Well, I think the same was true with the psalmist. He knew what it was to give thanks. And by the way, have you read through the psalms lately? David didn't always write just these real happy, joyful little psalms. There were some psalms where he's like, oh God, I'm, I'm so angry. And why do, the, why do the ungodly prosper? And why am I struggling? And read Psalm 78, or is it Psalm 73, where David complains to God. And then halfway through, he, he finally says, until I considered their end. You know, these people who are prospering one day will not prosper. And God will judge them. And so David had to work through some of those bitternesses. But he was a thankful person. He knew what God had done for him. And he was thankful for it. So as we come to Psalm 138. David's writing this psalm. <clears throat> He's writing poetry. I talked my friend into writing a poem to his girlfriend once. <laughs> He's still bitter at me about that. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I used to like to try to write poetry. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But poetry 
for the Hebrew writer, for the psalmist, is a little different maybe than what we're, we're used to. But a lot of the poetry in the Psalms has to do with parallel ideas and structures and familiar words where they can say similar words to emphasize the main idea. And we see some of that happening in Psalm 138. We see the idea of praise and thankfulness. And really, all together, I believe he's, he's saying that we should be, have joyful thanksgiving to God. Have joyful thanksgiving. And we're going to see three movements in this psalm. If we look deeper, we could look at structures of the poetry and all of that. But I want to look at three general movements. The first movement of this psalm is verses 1 through 3, where the psalmist says, I'm going to praise God. The second movement of the psalm is where David's compelling everyone around to, to join in praising God. The kings of the earth join us in praising God. And then the third movement might not be what you would expect. It's a little different. The third movement is this. I'm going to praise God even while I'm in the middle of difficult times. As those are the times that it might be difficult for us to be thankful. But we can be thankful during hard times. So point one, verses one through three say, say this. I give thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. <clears throat> Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called you, answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. David is taking time here to write a poem. So I can imagine David as he was a shepherd, as he was out in the wilderness, as he had his uh, soldiers following him as he was fleeing Saul, all these different times of solitude for David. He's writing poetry. Now he's probably not writing and rewriting like what your English teacher taught you to do because, well, let's just face it, they didn't have as much paper then as we do. Maybe he was writing on a piece of pottery or on a stone, but a lot of this is taking place in his head and he's writing a psalm of praise or of thankfulness to God. In other words, he's being thankful uh, for what God has done. And so he says, I will thank or I will give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. And so the focus here is God. And he's saying, I'm going to do this with my whole heart to God. I'm going to give thanks. Now, my challenge to you, and I know I'm not at the end of the sermon, is to take time to write out things that you are thankful for. You know, because it's so easy for us to, to uh, not see what God has done and not reflect on you know, what he's done over the year. We ought to sit down and deliberately write it. I'm not one that has kept a diary in the past or has written things down, but it's become my practice in the past several years to write out prayers and to write out uh, things that I'm thankful for and write out my prayer requests so I can track these things and it helps me verbalize them. And so I've begun to list out how I am thankful to God and it's a part of my daily prayer. Rather than just saying, God, give me these 10 things, I start out with, God, you're so good. God, you're so awesome to me. Thank you for your kindness. And for us to actually list them out would be a good exercise, not that we could think of everything. But David is deliberately going out of his way to give thanks to God. And he says, I'm going to thank God with my whole heart. Now, I know it's common for us to think that if we, if we said, oh, I love you with my whole heart, that we're talking about the emotional side of things. But when we see the word heart in, in Old Testament poetry, more often than not, we're talking about the mind or the place of understanding. The place of understanding happens or where we reason things out. And he's saying here, with a seat of his understanding or with his whole heart, he, had, he has decided he's going to give thanks to God. So there's a sincerity, there's a cognitive value to the thanksgiving that he's given. There's also an emotional content where he's like, God, I, I love you so much, thank you so much, as well as a physical element. Now maybe in congregations like this, we don't have the physical demonstration as much, but we do sing, right? That is a physical way to praise God. There's other ways as well where we could bow down or we lay on our face before God. That doesn't typically take place in this congregation, but I'm telling you it ought to at least take place in your private time. I think that you should get on your face before God. There's a lot uh, to say about your posture as you go before God. Well, here his posture was first, 
He was singing his praise. Now he says before the gods. Now we know there's no real God except God himself, right? Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, he is one. And so he is the one true God, and thou shalt worship no God, says in Exodus, other than the one true God, not to have any gods before me. And so he's not saying here there's these little junior gods watching. What he's saying here is before the false gods of uh, the land of Canaan, the false gods that some of the Israelites continue to worship, I'm going to sing praise. Now, do you think it's important to sing praise to God? I do. I think it's really important. If you get behind my wife and I in traffic, you'll think we're nuts because we're worshiping God. We're playing music in the car. And uh, in between that, I, I say, the light's green. And then I sing and I worship God. <laughs> Turn the corner. <laughs> and then I worship God again, without, hardly without a, a pause. You know, it's, it disturbs me how easily that can happen. <laughs> but to praise God with song. Listen to me. Music is so important, you guys. To have good Christian music, it speaks God's truth. Sometimes it's actually speaking God's word to us. Sometimes it's a testimony of how you feel about God. Sometimes it's a testimony of what God is doing in your life. And so we need to have different kinds of music, and we need to have music in our life. You might not sing well, but I think music is a major way where we keep the word of God in our hearts and our minds. That's why the Bible says that we're to sing in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And so we ought to fill our lives with music that would praise God. Now our music primarily is for glorifying God. It's a happy thing, primarily. Now, not every song is happy. Like I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. That part is not so good. But then we find he rescues us. So there is a happy element even to that. But by and large, our singing is an emotional, happy demonstration of the greatness of the God that we serve. And all said and done, we're probably a little too restrained in that. Now, we do the best we can. Maybe you don't know the song sometimes, and that makes it difficult. But with all of our hearts and our minds, we ought to engage in thankful worship to God. And David sang. Now, David will drive some of you nuts because it seems like he had a new song for every service. Now, he made it easier because in some of the Psalms, he actually writes, do this to the tune of that song. So it's like, you know, do, do this song to the tune of Danny Boy. <laughs> One of my favorite songs is to the tune of Danny Boy, but it's like you could do different songs to different tunes. And David did that a little bit, but he's always writing these new songs. I mean, how could we ever write all the songs that should be written about God? Well, David was a songwriter and he, he wanted to express himself to God physically through praise. But if you read just a little further, he says, I bow down towards your holy temple. So he was bowed down. He was giving thanks to God because of who God is. And so there was a physical posture. Now, David was not on the Temple Mount. Remember, there was no Temple Mount then. There was no permanent temple during David's time. David wanted to build it, and God said no. So actually, David went to Nathan and said, hey, I got this idea. I want to build the temple. And Nathan's like, yo, go and do it. God blesses everything you do. And then God spoke to Nathan that night and said, go tell David no. Your hands are bloody. You can't build the temple. Your son will build it. And so David was never, never able to worship in the temple, not the permanent one, but he was able to worship in the portable temple that was carried through the wilderness, that was set up outside of uh, Jerusalem. It had been moved around different places, and that's where David was. And at this point, he's in the courtyard of that temple. The reason I know that is because I, he says, I bow down towards your holy temple. Well, at least it indicates that he was probably there. One way or another, he was facing the temple. So why would he face the temple? Any ideas? Attention. For attention to, Show attention to, to God. God. But I, I have a question for you, Rick. Isn't God everywhere? Yeah. Well, why the temple then? It's a way of showing respect to him. It's, it, it's respect. God. Yeah, you're God and I Absolutely. Need to you. I need to look at you. Yep. There's one other thing that maybe we should consider when it comes to facing the temple. And the temp that is that the temple 
was the place where God met with man. That's the place where they met together. That's why the temple was so important, because God would meet with man there, but only under special circumstances. And so David was bowing towards the temple because he knew that's where he could meet with God. And it was a respect, and it was an honor. David wasn't worshiping the temple. David was there to worship God. And so he says, I bow down toward your holy temple. And then he says, I give thanks. Here's the reasons. Worth is assigned to God. I give uh, thanks to you for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. This is what I talked about a little bit with parallelism. It's the same thing. It's not the same thing, but it's the same thing. In this sense, your steadfast love is God's faithful love to us. That God's love is never going to end. It's never going to give up. It's never going to give out. It's always there. God's love is an enduring love. Isn't that how family love should be? You know, even though we might sometimes fall out of the family or make poor decisions, we can feel their disapproval. But to me, family is family. And when you're a part of the family of God, he's never going to turn his back on you. Now, you might feel his disapproval at times or his correction, but his steadfast love is his ever faithful love. He's never going to let us go. Isn't that profound? He's always going to hold on to us. Is that not enough reason to praise him? Is that not enough reason to give him thanks? And so it's his hesed love, his faithful love. And we can study it throughout the Old Testament that God continually talks about his hesed love, his continual love. I'm going to read to you from Lamentations. It kind of gives an idea of what hesed love is like. I'm going to read two quotes to you. This is from Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. The hesed of the Lord, or his faithful love, never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen? The second quote is this, and, and this is talking about Romans 8, 28, but it's talking about the same kind of love that God has for us. The Lord's hesed, or his faithful love, will never let us go. In the midst of life tri life's trials and tragedies, we may cry out to our loving Lord in confidence that nothing in all creation can ever separate us from the loyal love that chose us before time began, is sanctifying us in the present, and will faithfully bring us to our eternal home. Amen? It's going to carry us home. That's God's faithful love. We see next his exaltation. He says, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. God is exalted. He is greater than all things that exist. He's exalted. He's worthy of praise, worthy of worship. Then the last thing we see in this section is God's personal care for us. So I'm not a big Bette Midler fan, but she sings the song from a distance. I can hardly bear to listen to her sing. But it's probably your favorite song, so now you're offended. <laughs> But she sings this song from a distance. You know the words, right? It's all beautiful. It's all lovely. Have you ever seen a picture of the Earth from the space shuttle or whatever? You know, like from a spaceship. And it's all beautiful. And But the closer you get to Earth, the more reality sets in. Like if you ever actually land on Earth, you realize there's a lot going on that's not so good. And my point to you is that God's not just looking at us from a distance. God is up close and personal. He cares and he knows what we're going through. God's love is personal. And so David says, on the day I called, you answered me. Now, as a believer, I've been saved for more than 45 years now. And so I can tell you that there are times when God did answer prayer right away. There's also been times when God didn't answer prayer and sometimes for years but David saying in verse 3 that there were situations when he called on God and God answered him. On the day he called. And then when God answered prayer, his strength of his soul was increased. Isn't it neat when you see God pray? I always, if I have this pressing thing, I ask my wife to pray because it seems like God answers her prayers. And so to see her pray and to see a prayer answered by God is so refreshing. I mean, even to be here at Central Manor, to see how God has blessed us, I just can't get over how kind God has been to us. 
And to, to all of you, I'm sure you could testify as well, that David had reason to personally thank God. The second movement of the psalm calls the rest of the world to worship with David. And so as we start out in verse 4, it says, All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. But see, all the kings weren't then, were they? And are all the kings now? Are all the kings giving thanks to God? <clears throat> David's calling them into worship, I'm trying to make that point. He's calling them into worship, but in, in the scope of all things, one day all knees will bow, right? Every tongue will confess. But David here is talking about a call to worship from the kings of the world. Well, how will the kings of the world know unless we tell them, unless a Christian gives them God's truth, or unless they read the word of God, and so I believe the second section is about the world seeing what we're doing and that we would be a testimony of the greatness of God, that they would hear God's truth through us from God's mouth and that they would see the work of God in our midst and that they too would rejoice with us. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, has been, it's been called a guidebook for living in the kingdom. The truth is, it's a guidebook for those who will live in the kingdom, and that is us. And the kingdom will be fulfilled one day. Meanwhile, it's here in a sense, but it's not here in its completeness. But in its sense, we need to be a light to the world. Remember Matthew 5? You're the salt of the earth. That means we're to be a witness spiritually for the sake of righteousness and morality and for the sake of the gospel, that you're the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It sends forth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. You're the light of the world. If you took a candle and hid it under a bushel, what good is that? But you're the light of the world. So let your light so shine before men. And then what's the conclusion of that? Does anybody know? That they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. For the world to see our works. The world to see what we're doing. It's not that we're showing off. And, and it's not that we're trying to do anything. Except to let God be seen through us. We are priests before God. And there's a part of that that means. We don't have to go to someone else to make confession or whatever. You know go to a confessional. Or have someone else pray for us. We can pray directly to God right. But the, the bigger part of the priesthood of the believer is this. I'm going to quote a verse for you. I, I quote it often. I love it. The Bible says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, so that you would show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his glorious light. As priests before God, we're to be a light before the world. And the world needs to see what we're doing. And I think as that takes place in verses 4 and 5 and 6 will happen. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they'll sing of your ways, the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is high. He regards the lowly, but the haughty, he knows from afar. He sees them a long ways off and takes a different turn. The, the proud... One day we'll be humbled. But the, the humble God seeks and reaches out to them. Listen, God has condescended to us, right? That is really profound. That he's bent down to us and shown us his love. We need to give him praise and we need to let others see that God is within us. The world is watching us. And we need to let them see the goodness of God. We need to let them uh, hear us talk about God. We need to let them hear us pray. We need to let them see the glory of God and that we're praising God and serving God. God is worthy of praise and we want those around us to worship along with us. Now the third phase of the psalm is I've divided it up. It's not overly technical, but the third phase is this, that even when times get tough, God is there. It's true, right? God is there. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. Remember, the purpose of this psalm is grateful thanksgiving, joyful thanksgiving before God. But he's saying, though I walk in the midst of trouble. Well, there is a good thing. You've preserved my life. 
How many times have we brought our lives to the edge of chaos? Some of you can speak to that real clearly. But God has preserved us. Think about this, that God took us all out of the miry clay and he set our feet on solid ground. God has saved us. He preserved our lives. It says you stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. Your right hand delivers me. So the wrath of his enemies, David had a lot of enemies. And by the way, the world is our enemy. The devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's an enemy to your hearts, to your minds. The devil wants to see you fall. And one day God's going to put it to an end. It's going to end. Meanwhile, we're walking in the midst of trouble. And God one day is going to take our enemies with this hand. Set them aside. And with his right hand, he's going to judge the world. He's going to stretch out his hands. In the end of verse 7, with your right hand, you deliver me. And then it says in verse 8, isn't this profound? The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. That he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to be brought to completion. He's doing a work. Listen, he's doing a work in you. He's doing a work through you. Our God is great. And he's going to fulfill his purposes in and through our lives. David knew that. Then David concludes with two more really interesting things. He said, your steadfast Lord, love, O Lord, endures forever. Your steadfast love, it's that has said love, that faithful, unending love. It endures forever. So he says this little prayer. I have this prayer throughout my prayer. I have it three or four times. God, please bless me. Please bless what I'm doing. And David says, do not forsake the work of your hands. God, let it prosper, whatever it is that you're doing. But sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of difficult situations. Whether it's emotional, mental struggles, physical struggles, financial struggles. Sometimes we're going through hardships. They don't just disappear easily. Maybe we could call those time periods anxiety. Have you ever heard that word? And maybe somebody has told you that if you're ever anxious, you're in sin, but... Anxious is really a measurable thing. It's something that happens upon us. And it can be measured. Did you get a new job? Did you lose a job? Did you buy a new house? Did you just get married? Did you buy a car? Did you move somewhere? Did you get a different uh, you know, location? Things like that. You can measure the level of anxiety in somebody's life. And so anxiety just happens. It's not always that it's this evil sin thing. And it's not a switch that can be flipped on and off easily. It's not like, oh, I, I woke up today and I decided I'm going to be anxious. And then later on in the day, you took it and you flipped the switch off. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Sometimes it's just there. No matter how many times you read the verse, be anxious for nothing. It's still just there. And in those times, God is with us. Now we can alleviate that anxiety. We can deal with it. When it says be anxious for nothing, it's talking about the fact of don't resolve your problems through worry, but give it to God. And how does he say to do it? With prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Let your requests be known to him. And so we deal with those anxieties, but sometimes anxieties are what we live under. We don't want to dwell on them. We don't want to make anxiety the answer to our problems. But in the midst of whatever troubles that may exist in your life, you can still worship God. David did. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my, my life. And he's keeping us. There's a song. I'm sure some of you know it. It says, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you, Lord. This is for praying. God, I'm waiting on you. And I'm hopeful and I'm waiting on you, Lord, though it's painful. But patiently I will wait and I will move ahead, bold and confident, taking every step in obedience. While I'm waiting, I'll serve you. While I'm waiting, I'll worship. And while I'm waiting, I will not faint. I'll be running the race even while I wait. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you, Lord, and I'm peaceful. I'm waiting on you, Lord, though it's not easy. But faithfully I will wait, yes, I will wait and I will move ahead bold and confident, taking every step in obedience. I'll be running the race even while I wait. I will move ahead bold and confident. I will be taking every step in obedience. And while I'm waiting, I will serve you. 
And while I'm waiting, I will worship you. And while I'm waiting, I will not faint. God does deliver us from trouble. But it's not always the second we snap our fingers and give our list to God of all the things we want him to do. Sometimes we have to depend on him for that peace that passes all understanding. To guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. That peace in the midst of trouble. And God is one that's worthy to be praised. Even if we're going through a very difficult time, there's reasons for us to be thankful to God and to praise God. And so, my proposition to you today is that you need to live a life of praise and thanksgiving to God. Another song some of you might know is this. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for victories won. Oh, thank you, Lord, for thy love and tender care, for thy word and answered prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for love like thine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for grace divine. Oh, thank you, Lord, for thy cross of Calvary, for thy blood that cleanseth me. Thank you, Jesus, that thou art mine. Thank you, Lord. Live a life of praise and thanksgiving to God.